One of the primary symptoms is just waking up despite getting what you would consider a full night's sleep and just feeling like you didn't get in sleep at all and you're waking up unrefreshed sleep. Now that can obviously have a lot of different causes, but if you're sleeping through the night but actually not feeling like you slept through the night, that's really certainly the number one. Morning headaches, uh, another big one that people can experience, um, and just general lack of energy and well-being. Close to 20% of the general population has some form of sleep disordered breathing. That uh, the percentage of patients who have clinically significant sleep apnea, meaning moderate to severe disease, that's going to increase your risk of all the factors that we talked about previously, um, probably in the 10% range or so. It increases with weight, it increases with age. Women after menopause, their risk increases substantially. Um, these are all factors. So that 10 to 20% number probably goes up in uh, an older population of, I'm gonna choose my numbers very carefully, uh, 70 years old, 75 years old, 80 years old, it probably has a higher risk than uh, someone who's in their 30s or 40s. You just can imagine that every single time you have an episode of obstruction, your oxygen levels drop. That basically puts stress on your heart, puts stress on your lungs. <clears throat> and we know that untreated, it basically has the the potential to lead to high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke risk, diabetes. It has significant impact in terms of mood disorders, depression. There's really a whole series of downstream effects that occur, and there's actually, believe it or not, even some potential risks that sleep apnea and poor sleep can lead to increased cancer risk. So it really is a life-threatening disorder. It's a surgically implanted device, but it basically is a, what I like to describe it as a pacemaker for the tongue. So it is a, a stimulation to the nerve to the tongue, and what that does is that in response to every breath that's taken throughout the course of the night, it sends a little pulse to the nerve that basically opens the airway. And so the beauty of it is, is that not only does it impact the tongue, but it impacts the entire airway for the patients who are good responders. Um, the stimulation that's, that's, uh, pr that's produced by this device is very gentle. It doesn't produce an electrical shock or a painful stimulation. It just is sort of a strange sensation that your tongue's moving when you're not telling it to, and it's on throughout the course of the night. Turn on and off with a remote control, so you turn it on before you go to bed, and when you wake in the morning, turn it off and go about your business. First and foremost, there's hope. All right, that's the most important thing to take home. So. Um, Again, the good news is there are plenty of alternatives, and unfortunately, often, all too often, people are not told that there are options to consider. And I wish I could say your experience was unique. It is not. Um, this is why Dr. Huntley and I have a, actually have a job. Um, because CPAP, as I said, it's, and again, I'm not here to bash CPAP. CPAP works, and there are, there are plenty of people who, who live their life and are ecstatic and can't imagine going a night without it. But unfortunately, it's actually really a minority of patients. And so the most important thing to take home, again, is, is that we can find a solution for you. There are plenty of things that can be considered. And again, this may be the solution for you. It may be an oral appliance. It may be surgery to alter the anatomy. It may be several different things, but we can find something to help you. So there are a number of factors that we use to assess candidacy. First, as we already described, it's moderate to severe sleep apnea. It's not indicated for mild sleep apnea. Um, next factor is basically the presence of the right anatomic pattern of collapse that we assess on drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So that drug-induced sleep endoscopy is critical to making sure that you're going to be a responder to this device. And the last factor that primarily is looked at with this is body mass index. So uh, as body mass index increases, it tends to influence almost everything in sleep apnea world. Um, as a general statement, um, the biggest issue when it comes to body mass index actually is not the medical indications, it's the insurance indications. So this therapy um, is one that uh, insurance is, you know, it's being new and novel, um, do look at with scrutiny. And so as a result, they will look at things like body mass index as a cutoff. But we've implanted patients as, as high as a body mass index of 40 um, successfully with this therapy. So I wouldn't personally consider it a cutoff, but as I said, you have to be aware if you're a patient coming in that if your body mass index is elevated, it may be something that your insurance uses to, to actually stand in the way of your getting to the therapy. 22 years old is the youngest that uh, the FDA has approved, at least. Um, there's no upper limit. What's the oldest we've done is, I believe, 82. Is that, uh, I think looking at our data, 82 is probably the oldest that we've done. 
So sleep apnea comes in two flavors. Uh, central sleep apnea is where the brain does not tell the lungs to, to take a breath. This is the much less common form. Um, see it in patients with heart failure. You see it in patients who are on chronic narcotics for, say, lo low back pain. Um, sometimes after someone has had a stroke, you may see this. So you're saying for this central apnea, it, this is not going to take care of it? Less than, correct. So on the sleep study, less than 25% central events or central sleep apnea events, um, this is still indicated. So okay. if the majority of the issue is obstructive sleep apnea, this works well. Very minimal restrictions after recovery. Um, flying in an airplane is not an issue. Getting through airport security is not an issue. Um, swimming is not an issue. Um, contact sports, be careful, but uh, probably not an issue. Um, X-rays are fine, CAT scans are fine, PET scans are fine, ultrasounds are fine. Uh, it's approved for an MRI of the head, neck, and extremities. I had sleep apnea when I was 118 pounds and 20, 25 years old. I'm 63. So I've battled this for many, many, many years. About 24 years ago, I had a laser-assisted uveoplasia, which is they remove the back of my, the uvulid that hangs in the back of your throat. <clears throat> I had that removed surgically. That did not work. I tried a CPAP. That did not work. I went to various other devices, oral devices. Um, there's one, I'm not sure what they're called. They're, they're like some type of nasal thing. Yeah. Um, that did not work. Tried again to go back to CPAP. Because at this point, then they were having variable pressure, the IPAPs or the BiPAPs, I'm sorry. Um, and it was easier to tolerate. That did not work. And then I started looking. Linda, when you say it did not work, I mean, you just, you weren't sleeping any better at all? Or, I mean, no. you just. I was not. I would take the mask off in the middle of the night without knowing about it. And um, as the doc said, they do leak. And they make these awful sounds. So if you think they, the uh, herd of elephants is bad, a CPAP that's leaking is a thousand percent worse. Um, I would take it off. I never felt any different, never felt any better. And then I just started researching what, I used to look all the time for what's new, and I saw Inspire. So I took a look at it. At that point, there were only three hospitals in Philadelphia, or in the state, um, Jefferson Penn and UPMC. Okay, Jefferson, I work close to the train station, so I looked at Jefferson, and they listed the docs, and I went, well, this guy's got an email address. <laughs> Let me... <laughs> Life is so random. It was, just, it was okay, he's got an email address, and I... We can give you a cell phone number, too, if anyone yeah. wants it. <laughs> and I sent him an email, and I'd say literally within, I don't even think it was 12 hours, that he sent me back an email, asked me some questions, and we talked for a little bit, and he said, it sounds like you might be a candidate. Come on down. I did the physical. I did the drug-induced endoscopy, and we scheduled the surgery. Uh, the day of the surgery was, I think my surgery probably was about three hours. Um, uh, recovered, I mean, recovery room. Got up, got dressed, and my husband and I went home. It's not activated for at least, I believe, four weeks or so, and that's to heal. And I went back, activated it, and of course, the first time you do it, well, <laughs> it sounds, that's really strange. When we turned it on, it's set at a, a variable level. There's, on my remote, which is a little bit different, there's, uh, there's buttons that I can change the, the um, intensity. And they get let, you get used to it for about 30 days, and then you go back to the sleep center, and the sleep techs will actually um, control the pressure or the intensity of, of how it's moving your tongue to the best, the best for you. And it's set. If you need it changed, you go into the office and have it changed. There are actually two different settings, and one is calibrated to when should this go on. And I believe mine's calibrated for 30 or 45 minutes. So I take this little remote and I put it here and I push on. And it gives you a little tinge that lets you know that it's working. And I start reading. I go to sleep. I never feel it go on. There's another button that's pause. 
and you pause it and my phone rings. It does take control of your tongue, so you might have a difficult time speaking. So hit pause, it stops. My pause is calibrated for 15 minutes. And then I go back to bed, it kicks back on. I'm already asleep, I never feel it. First, one of the nice things about the device is that it's very customizable. So, you know, human beings are very different and we all have very different needs. And so the device has the ability to adjust a lot of different parameters to try and make it just more comfortable for you. Because part of what we rely on is you have to use the device for it to be effective. So um, one of the beauties, as you also mentioned, is that we have great data that patients adhere to this data, so, or adhere to this, this therapy. They actually like it, they use it, they want to use it, they feel better. Um, so we do a program in a range that allows adjustment within a sort of a narrow field. So when it's first turned down, we give a fairly broad range just for patients to get acclimated to the therapy. And then once it's programmed, we sort of know the basic range where it's really effective, and we sort of program within that range. For Linda. For Linda for, specifically. You know, for every mm -hmm. given patient, it is unique what they're go how it's going to be programmed. And that really allows patients to self-adjust. And so if there are times when they feel like for whatever reason they have a cold or for whatever reason they're just a little sensitive and they need to turn down the stimulation, they can. Um, if they feel like it's just not quite where it needs to be, um, they can turn it up. Um, and this is also a nice feature because, you know, things change over time. So what your experience is in 10 years, your weight may change. Other factors may influence other medications that you may have to take that may influence sleep apnea. And the nice thing is, is that when those things change, we can adapt the de device to actually your needs. I have no issues with it. It doesn't hurt. I don't feel it. It doesn't, I don't get a sore throat. I have no problem with the incisions. So I really, for me, don't have a whole lot of reason to run down to the office other than maybe an annual checkup, how you doing, fine. For this, it is, it, it is uh, effective about 90% of the time and recognize that when we are considering effectiveness, our goals are basically threefold. Goal number one is to improve the numbers on a sleep study so we're less worried about your health risks. Goal number two is to improve the quality of your sleep so you wake up feeling refreshed. And goal number three is to make sure we're actually impacting the bed partner too. So we're trying to basically achieve all three goals and that's what I consider success. So it was FDA approved in 2014. Uh, we were one of the first centers to actually adopt this, so we've been doing it since 2014. So the, the battery life on this is estimated somewhere around 11 years, and uh, fortunately that's a fairly minor thing. The procedure itself is of an involved procedure, so I think it's important to get off the table that it is a couple hours, <coughs> excuse me, of surgery, um, but the Change of the what's called the internal pulse generator is a very simple thing to do. <clears throat> I think what's one other important thing, and I think Lisa or Linda, Thank you. how long have I known you? Um, <clears throat> can answer to this. The recovery is actually quite benign, so patients don't generally experience a lot of pain postoperatively. It has been Im immensely impactful for patients, and it's been immensely impactful on a number of different levels. First. We have patients like Linda who are success stories who just basically feel like a different person. The second really big, big positive that has come of this therapy is, is that it's gotten a lot of patients who are like Linda, who have been struggling with therapy for years and who are told over and over again, here's your CPAP, use your CPAP. Well, I'm struggling with my CPAP. Well, try your CPAP again, try your CPAP again, and basically just get frustrating and put it, frustrated and put it in the closet. Inspire has gotten patients to see people like me to basically find an alternative, and it doesn't always mean that I'm going to be bringing them to Inspire. Many, for many patients, it will, but it means that we're going to find other solutions for them. We're going to find a solution. So it has really been a game changer in our in our practice. So the two big insurers in this area are Aetna and the Blue Cross plans, and both of them consider this non-investigational anymore, where the investigational label was how they got away saying, we're not covering this. And they've changed their policies that if all of the indications that Dr. Boone was talking about are met, um, we certainly will get a prior authorization from the insurance company, but it's a, a fast turnaround. And the amount of appeals that we're doing are significantly less. Medicare also will, will cover this and considers this uh, an appropriate therapy. Medicare covers pretty much everything, yeah. 
and again, the only the only specific issues you ideally should have a sleep study before, but if not, that's stuff that we can actually obtain an order for you if you haven't had an updated sleep study. We'll often want to get an updated sleep study just so we have a baseline. If you know some people come in and haven't had a study for 15 years, um, and we do like to get some new information just to make sure we really have a handle on what's going on. But yes, the short answer is Medicare covers all of the above. Women have breast tissue, which does hide the implant. Um, for men, you would see a bulge, but it does not limit your activity. It doesn't get in the way of any activities, really, in general. And, um, but it is important to recognize that you, will see, you would see a little bulge, and, of course, there's a little scar there. It's, uh, it's very slight. Yeah. I've recently run two 5Ks where I would never even attempt that before. I, didn't, I was too tired, would never make it. I ran a 5K in March and I ran a 5K in April. It wasn't pretty, but I did it. <laughs> I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Um, first and foremost, for the people who are struggling with sleep apnea, most important thing is don't ignore it. It will take, it will take its toll on you. Um, and the second thing to just get to, to hit home is there is hope for all of you. There are options to consider. We, we have lots that we can do for you. And one way or another, we can get you to a place where, number one, we can improve your sleep, your bed partner's sleep, and we can improve your health. Inspire. Sleep apnea innovation. Learn more and view important safety information at InspireSleep.com.